So this is Coffee Compiler Club. Um, anything to do with compilers and language runtimes, uh, you know, typing systems and garbage collection and concurrency and exception throwing and all that kind of stuff. These are all fair game topics. Um, you're being recorded live. You'll show up on, you know, YouTube within the hour of the day or however long. If you don't like getting recorded, bail out now. Uh, open mic, ask what you want. Um, I don't have any set agenda. Conversation goes where it goes. I reserve right to moderate, never had to do it. That's the end of the spiel. There is a, a um, there's a chat window, there's a document window. The document window will both show up on Twitter, but the document window is live and shared and editable, so it's a little more convenient. Um, after that, we have actually kind of two new people. Um, let me start with Connor, who's just first time, but then Eon, I, I'm curious to hear, oh, maybe you said it last time, I don't remember. Give me like 30 seconds of why you're interested, Connor. Sure, absolutely. Um, kind of compilers are kind of just like a, a like a hobbyist interest. I do machine learning research like professionally, and that's like my main uh, interest. But I've gotten more into it, kind of combining the two, just because I've been working on a lot of like automatic differentiation stuff. And it turns out, yeah, you have to do a lot of compiler stuff for that. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. Cool. So um, Ian, what, what's what's your story? Yeah, so uh, I used to manage the JVM team at Twitter uh, for a few years back, and I now manage the JVM team over at Netflix. So this is uh, yeah, adjacent to the, my professional interests. Uh, mess around with a few small toy languages and things like that, but uh, always good just to hear what's going on. And So I have you know, seen you before. I know I've seen your name before. Oh yeah, we, we uh, I think we had dinner at uh, Chris Salinger's uh, Java Hawaii thing. Oh, that was yeah, back. that was fun actually. It was, it was. So, but yeah, I used to work with a bunch of your former son colleagues. Gotcha, and, uh, gotcha. Yeah. yeah, and I miss the whole conference spiel thing. At least an hour debating when is it safe to go traveling again. Sucks. It does it does for sure? Yeah. yeah. Fine. So I'll, I'll throw out a AA update, which is very boring, which says I'm back to the theory side of things. I, I think I'm getting my theory more locked down. Um, and it, but it, 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 I'm still like bouncing back and forth. So, so the light, last go round is I got more aggressive about my testing because it's a workless algorithm, workless can be visited in any order. So I, in fact, tried shuffling order around, found a lot of odds and ends. And the main one I found is that I would get the first error, which I would then encode into a string. Hey, I got an error here on the error cases, you know, the cases that just have an error. Um, you, you can't type this. And then if I shuffle the order, I get a different error, which makes a golden file testing really painful because you get a different error according to a random number die roll. So I've been trying to make my errors canonical. You always get the same set of errors in the same order every time, independent of how I visit the work list, which means I have to have a way to exactly represent the error state of an untypable program in a way that is canonical or like the, the Henley Milner, you get the, the maximal uh, uh, best type out, you get the, the principal type out, even if there's errors or else you don't get the same error out. So that turns out to be, I'm getting, I'm getting a principal type for error programs, which is somewhat of a trick. So that's what I've been spending the last week on and I'll probably spend another couple of days at it before it's- And you're like, confident that that's like computable and isn't gonna fall back to try all the orders. Exactly. Um, oh no, well, right. So, so, so there's two different things here. I, I'm, I'm confident that I can get a principal error, a principal term for errors. Um, the, the other one is the, I'm just doing a s trial set of all the random shuffles on the work list, right? I'm not going to obviously try them all. Um, so I'm, I'm picking four random work list shuffles for each test. I could pick 10 random work list shuffles, but the, there's a law of diminishing returns here. I'm, I'm, I'm rapidly discovering all my unimplemented and places where I didn't quite cut and paste correctly from left to right are all getting sorted out and you know I think I'm I'm already there. So once I get all my error terms sorted out and I can run my my 60 odd tests to the end without them ever 
complaining independent of order, I'll raise the order count a few more times. And if it quits finding new things, I'll declare victory. So, you know, testing never proves the absence of errors, um, but it can give you confidence that you don't have any errors. That's where I'm at. Yeah, test proves that there's no obvious bugs, not that there's obviously no bugs. Exactly, exactly. And in, in this case, the amount of code involved is finite, it's not huge. So the amount of cases that have to be covered in the code are modest and I can run the coverage checking, which I've run it in the past, it's pretty good. So I'm gonna finish out my work list shuffle and then ask the coverage test as well. And if I cover all the cases with my work list shuffle, I'm gonna declare you know, victory for the Alliance and move on. So that's where I'm at with AA. All right, and we're missing our usual assortment of people who like to drive a conversation by asking leading questions. So the question I've been thinking about, um, I listen to the closure talks by Rich Hickey occasionally. Yeah. I find them inspiring. Yeah. And he talks a lot about how if you program with sequences and maps, you tend to get, you tend to save yourself from this proliferation of types that you get where you just have lots of little structs all over the place. And I was wondering about how do you keep the sort of API separate from the ABI, where you want to say, okay, I know I need to have these five types, but any type that has more than I asked for, I should also be callable with. You all should also should be what? I should also be callable with. If I have a function where I know that it needs to have dot EQ and it needs to have dot hash. Right. And I've actually got a whole bunch of extra stuff. That's duct typing. And you if still it's not strongly typed, it's structural typing. And I'm, I'm AA structurally typed. So you're asking how it's done? More no how it feels like you want to use the types to do dynamic dispatch. But you right. also want to be structurally typed where things can accept different things. Right. Right. So what do I do when I'm trying to do both of those things at the same time? I may want to have two different types that have essentially the same set of required functions. So, so the structural typing that comes out, and, and I'm doing this in A, but it's not like it's new here. This has been around the block, is um, adding records or fields to Henry Milner. And that the if you're well typed, it'll guarantee you that you have a dot EQ and dot hash field whenever you call your hash table function. But it will also claim that there may be extra fields or extra fields are allowed and he won't bother to check what extra fields you have when you're calling hash table. You'll just have extra fields. And that means that whatever shows up there will have a dot EQ and a dot hash. And in the case of AA, those fields will actually be your functions and you'll do a field load to get the function and run. And it's just the same as doing a, a virtual table call. And then now becomes an implementation issue. I can have everyone have their own dot EQ field You've defined a field called dot EQ. Everyone can have the field. It eats space in the object. It's the same for all objects of a particular class. So there's a simply a compiler optimization in the hood that says I lump all those together by class. And loading the dot EQ field happens because I go to your class table instead of on the object itself. So I load first the class table from an object, and then I load the dot EQ field out of it. That's a V table call. That's a dynamic single dispatch. And the only thing I did there was I took Henley Milner with record typing, which is well understood and has a strong theory. And as I compiled optimization, I said, all guys who have the same basic set of fields, and some of these fields have static final functions in them, I moved them off into, I broke that object into two parts, a shareable part that has only static finals that are all the same values, and a, and a non-shared part, which is your instance class. So it, it's in the end, it's, it's it's like nothing new from a theory point of view, and it's not really much new in in a implementation side either. It's just the way you view it. So how do you decide either I want a virtual call in this function or I want to make a clone of my function? So there's one version that operates on A's and one version that operates oh, okay. on B's. Yeah, right. No, I'm doing that too, but I'm not. I haven't sorted that out from the types. Because I imagine you might. If I have a program where at this particular call site, 90% of them are A's and 9% of them are B's and 1% is everything else. Yeah. 
So the first thing I may want to say, I want to clone an A version and a B version and an right. everybody else. Right. This is Hotspot doing Java things for the last you know umpteen zillion years. Does exactly this because you have the profile data. You start with the profile data. Okay. If you don't have the profile data, you can't make that claim. <clears throat> you got the profile data, then then you do what you need to do. So one of them is you look at the call site and you have this ninety nine one split, and you decide how you want to implement that. In the case of Hotspot, first thing he does is he does the if test for the 90. He has, a, he has a heuristic that says, I'm going to split this because the ratio between the hot guy and the second hot guy is some number, whatever, the, whatever your tunable factor is. It's a heuristic. You're greater than 50%. Okay, I put an if test in. Now I have a static call to the 90% case. Separately, as a separate decision, given a static call to this one particular method that I know has a particular hotness and the size of the method, I choose to inline it locally right here, right now, or not. Right. And then I repeat that process for the 9% case. And the, and the 1% case is I probably do a hard B call because you probably have a lot of cases. And if I know, load a new class, so a new type starts showing up in that spot that right. we've never seen before. Right. Do I have to recompile that function or? OK, so as I described it, no. And whether or not you want to is a different question. So as I described it, it says, you're, you're this guy, you're the 9% or you're the 1%, which is a V call. Well, the V call handles all the other cases. So if you haven't extended the 90% or the 9%, but you extended in the 1%, you're already covered, you have correct code. The thing that may change here is your, your profile may change. And the, the, the current, the, the C2 as I left it, you know, 15 years ago, didn't recompile based on your profile changing. The assumption was your profile was statically frozen at the time of compilation, except that if some other event triggered a recompile, you reinvestigated the current set of profiles. Now, the funny game there is that at the time that you put the original jitted code in, it took over the dominant amount of calls and did not collect stats. So you had been collecting stats versus the interpreter or C1. Suddenly, you had a better method that didn't collect stats. You ran the better method. It was much faster. It did so not collect stats. I have stats. stats on three through N, but I have no stats on one or two because they were in the hot path. Right. It's really 10,000 is the limit. So the first 10,000 cases you have stats on, at 10,001, you quit getting stats. OK. You eventually flip back to the interpreter. Along the way, you probably did pick up a lot of stats because other threads, running other code, we're hitting pieces of parts that you inline. If you came in through the hot path, you're on the hot guy, you got no stats. But if you came in through some other paths, you're in the non inline versions of the same things, and you got some amount of stats there. Then, when you decided to load the class and you blew out the main guy, you went back to the interpreter anyhow, and you interpreted another 10,000 goes and got another set of stats. And these are all cumulative. And then you went back and did it again. So, you know, you could always show test cases or examples where this is a suboptimal in a lot of ways. But on average, statistically speaking, it does pretty well. And you have a regional stats at the time that you JIT the second or third time. But definitely if your program goes through phase shifts where it's hot in this way for a while and then it's hot for that way for a while and then back to this, the compiler probably takes stats for us in one of those two phases, but not the other, and doesn't know that there's another phase. And you get lopsided JITting based on you know, one set of phases and not the other. Yeah, I've seen a lot of the beginning of the program behaves very different than the steady state of the program. The, the, I don't the, know how often things go hard left turn after it's been running for two weeks. Exactly. So, so the usual story is during startup, all the things that got hot aren't running long enough to matter. They get jitted, but they all get jitted with kind of random numbers, and that's a fine answer. And then by the time you hit steady state, you end up do jitting the important code at the, with the steady state version of the profile data. That, that's reasonable. Hey, Matt, I see you threw a bunch of interesting things. You want to throw them in the, in the chat? You want to throw them in the document as well? I don't know what dictionary Do we have the link to the Google Docs this time? I think I missed that. Oh, OK. Um, let me throw it in the chat. It went out with the link, but I don't know. I'm like getting rigorous about throwing out the new Google Docs with the invites. Oh, you're right. I got it with the link. 
But anyway, the, the point is that there are a lot of languages that have somewhat similar implementations, but they call them different things. So for example, in C++, we use vtables for that, yeah. which are basically, you can think of them as structs of pointers to functions, and that's how you implement this dynamic dispatch. I like the name existentials or existential types for what this is achieving, because the point is you are only interested in stating that there exists a method. So maybe you have a hash table, there exists a method get, there exists a method set where you can get the value corresponding to a given key. And maybe you have a fancy hash table that has a lot of other methods too, but you don't necessarily care about that when you only accept an interface of this type. And the way you achieve this is you can also have a witness table. Those witness tables are very similar to V tables in C++, but Swift basically holds them in a separate memory area. And you can also pass the, what in Haskell is called dictionary, which is basically passing those structs of pointers to functions together with the type. That's what Haskell does to implement type classes, which is a little bit different, but they also do dynamic dispatch. You may have, for example, something that is equality comparable. Which... Hang on a second, Matt. Let me, let me. Somebody was editing the, the timeline in the doc. Whoever you are, would you go ahead and throw some more timestamps in? Because uh, that was very convenient for me <laughs> to not have to do that. <laughs> Sorry, go on, Matt. No worries. I'm, worried. I'm afraid to update the Google Docs because I see multiple concurrent updates and shared mutable state is very scary. So <laughs> I would wait. <laughs> okay, yeah. Oh, there it goes. Some numbers are showing up finally. Yeah, um, I got into this because I was like looking at Vtable implementations and thinking about when doing C2, so 20 years ago, there were plenty of places where I wanted to have static final constant values that were the same in a Vtable. They were the same for all class of a particular node. Um, but to get them, I had to make a V call. So this is all, you know, C2 performance, a bazillion V calls going on in there. Can I replace a V call with a V table load with, of a constant, of a class specific constant? Like this node is known to be associative and I can reorder it with the associative logic or not. This node has a control edge and is dependent upon where it lands or it does not and is more reorderable. This node has, you know, a memory edge floating around and has to participate in aliasing relationships or not. And there are a lot of these Boolean tests and small image recount tests that are V calls, but I, I actually wanted them just to load a fricking number, usually a Boolean from the V table. And then I was like, well, why can't I have a V table that has other things than, uh, you know, whatever. And then the next thing is, well, if I can't have if I can have a V table has other things, why is it a V table being defined by the runtime instead of by the compiler? And then while I was screwing out the AA, I was like, well, I can make all functions fields. That's kind of cool. And then it occurred to me, I can throw all the static final fields with functions in the V table. Oh, wait, that's exactly what I'm looking for. I just want static final, not static. I want final fields that are the same for a class of objects. I'll make a V call, V table for them throw those fields into the V table and get them out of the shared, move, put them in a shared place and get them out of the, the per instance. And lo and behold, it gives me a C++ or a Java model right away, but it also allows to have things that are not functions in the V table. And what goes in the V table is totally defined by the compiler per se, not directly the runtime. So that's how I kind of got there from this backed into it. That works for dispatching as object dot method. Yeah. Is that going to work as well for doing function of object where I want to dispatch on the type of the function call? So uh, the 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 dispatch logic here, like like function of whatever, wherever you came that function from, is how do you define where you get it from? <clears throat> In the land here of AA, the, the function comes from you loaded it from a field as a, and I knew already that this pointer, or or I had to type it. So um, in, in your case here, I'm using what, what people call um, what do we call uniform call syntax or something. Those two are totally identical for me. Um, I, I don't have any difference between them. 
It's except that the, no, I don't have any difference between them in this case. If you have a function with no arguments, then I have to look it up in the space and there's no argument around and I'm done. If I have a function that has a first argument and I have a function name that doesn't come from that argument, then I'm going to claim it came, then that's the function you have and your dispatch is done. You didn't have a dynamic dispatch. In this case, it's based off the type of F. So if F has multiple variations, actually for me, I, I'm, I'm in the zone of, if you don't have it off of an O, then the name lookup had better give me a function of the correct type directly. So I'm not allowing multiple Fs to be in scope with different types unless they're associated with a dynamic dispatch off of the first argument. Because it's an overloading thing. It's like, what did you mean here? You called square root or something stupid, math.square root. It has a first argument of a float. Okay, maybe I, I claim that one's typed instead of coming off of dispatch off of floats. So you have three different math that square roots. One takes complex, one takes this, one takes that. You know, maybe in that case, I guess overloading is okay because you can tell them apart, but I would do that with dynamic dispatch. I'm trying to get another one. Just have a do I want there to be priorities there or to just blow up on ambiguity? Well, that's the issue. So as soon as you have anything that's slightly ambiguous or more complicated, like Julie has a problem that the rules get really complicated really quick. And then I know it, uh, Jan, who's not on here, has argued for Julia's type dispatch rules, but they get complicated quick and then it's hard to tell who you're calling. And so in the, in the, in the name of easy to understand code, I claim the corrector answer is to say, it's dynamic on the first argument or it's static and there is no typing dispatch and F has to be unambiguous or, or I declare ambiguity error. You have a few different Fs, they take three different arguments. I don't care, it's ambiguous, stop now. Make it dynamic off the first argument and we're all happy. So you do have a lattice. Yeah, so I you could tell. do something like if this yeah. dominates the other thing, then yeah. it's gonna work. Right. But if it doesn't I, dominate, then right. and, error. And I'm happy to go back and forth on this one. Um, you know, if there's an obvious dominating call, I can, I can tell you apart, you know, you have one F that takes animals and one F that takes cats and the cat's more specific. So you take it. That's a kind of the general rule for these guys. You have a more specific case. I can totally tell a lot of these cases apart. I can also do dynamic dispatch and say, I'll do a cat.f and you hand me a cat. You got a cat.f. And if you handed me something that wasn't a cat, it defaulted to animal.f. Um, and then if I say it that way, it, everyone understands what's going on. If I do it with, oh, it has to be the most precise answer, then it gets a little more dicey as to which one you meant. I have an F that takes a float, an F that takes a, a small int, and all small ints are floats. Which one dominates? Well, F of small int, you know, F of int eight clearly is more sharp than F of float, which takes ints up to two to the 57. Right. But it's also kind of weird. And that's what I'm talking about. It's like, this is your weirdness budget going into the language. You're staring at the language. Which F am I calling here? Yeah, to some extent, if I have a dependency where it's like, I have level one, and then I have level two A and level two B, and then level three depends on both level two A and level two B. Maybe I want to just say this is ambiguous and blow up. I'll throw some more examples here. I mean, the interesting cases are there are going to be when you have two or more arguments and yeah, exactly. the first one's sharper or the second one's sharper and you have to choose between first is sharper or second is sharper. That also might be a place where you'd want to say, this is not strictly ordered, please blow up. So, so under that logic, I have this rule, which says that the eight bit is clearly dominating the 32, which is clearly dominated by 64, but they're not, no relation to the int 64. So it's kind of a funky dispatch rule, right? I've defined three different Fs. One takes an int eight, one takes an int 32, one takes an int 60, a float 64, eh, ugly. 
soon as you have two arguments, the rules get really ugly. And I can totally define them and get unambiguous definitions based on multi arguments, although you do get weirder rules on like Henley Milner won't help me here because he doesn't do this thing the right way. Um, so, so the ambiguity rule, the ambiguity resolution rules, if I have a stack series of Fs of, of, you know, function A calls B calls C, but the A's and B's and C's all take insert floats and return different types of different things, then you get like this space of exponential search for what set of Fs I'm going to call here, which returns some, some values which force the next layer down to call different versions which force the next layer down and which one fits and is there only one in the end that's unambiguous. Now it becomes difficult for the person to look at it and know what's getting called. And I claim that's a bad design point. That's what happens to Julia. So if instead it came along and said, it's dispatch on the first argument or there's only one F in scope. So if you have an F in scope, there has to be one and it's going to be called directly and those args better match directly. And if you have two Fs in scope, then immediately I throw an, uh, an ambiguity error at you as soon as you define the second F. You have to find F is equal to function of blah, blah, blah. Then you define F is also equal to function of blah, blah, blah. One shadows the other, depends on which way you put it in the scope, one completely shadows the other or, or I declare ambiguity on you and say no. And you think you can get that to blow up at the time you define F, not necessarily yeah. when you try to use yeah. it. Yeah, 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 this is, this one, this one's easy. So that's, that's a case of, I said F is equal to function of whatever. Okay, then I said F is equal to function of whatever. Okay, right away you have two function definitions for F back to back. One of them shadows or else I claim that you're resetting a final field. Right, this is a second functional definition and you're resetting a final field. So I say, you can't reassign a final field. Okay, so make F a dynamic field, you know, a var update. Well, that's just replacement. And now the second F dominates again. And it's just like, you, you reset it to a new value. Okay, fine. So you didn't get two different Fs that you dispatch on. But having said all of that, when I do operator overloading, I exactly have this case where I have multiple operator definitions, but they fall into the category of I'm dispatching on the first argument. So if I come out here and I say, so this, this one is, this one is, you know, two Fs, uh, uh, second one is a reset of a final, is, 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 a, is a second set of a final field, I can't type, final field, so is an error right away. And then, uh, so there's no dispatch logic, no, no dispatch question. And then there's uh, 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 two Fs, but dispatching on first argument. So here I'm gonna say, I define int to be a struct. Wait, int's a struct? Okay, so this is just me doing, you know, a uh, 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 capital Y integer boxed version. So ignoring that. You know, Google's trying to tell me you have a flight on Houston on Wednesday because I said at sign open and he's like calendar events. Stop that, Google, what the hell? Plus is a function that does what a hell plus does for ints, right? And then I have another one of these like float here. And then later on, I can say one plus two. That is the same as saying, oh, look at you doing an automatic arrow, Google. God, some there's all kind of new things have showed up on the Google land here. It's a plus with one, two as the call. And actually to do operator syntax, I now require underscores where the arguments go. So I can tell it's an infix call instead of a pre or post fix. And if I did one plus two plus two dot three, that will, why did you not do this, Google? Boy, what's your operator? I have to do two, okay. It's this of one dot two, two dot three. So, so th those two forms are the same, except the dispatch on the first argument. So I get whichever function I get. I got a new guy coming here. So, so the, that's my current theory of how to do that for AA. Um, I claim it's, it's unambiguous and I hope obvious. And I think 
it's very similar to the behavior you get out of other people, except I allow sort of anonymous uh, 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 arbitrary overloadings. I just have to dispatch off the first argument. In this syntax, any function name that starts with an underscore is a suffix. Anything that ends with an underscore is a prefix. And anything that has both can do infix. And they can have three as well. Yeah. Yeah, no, just not quite the rule, but it's close. Um, I'm going back and forth on how the, the final trigger needs to be. I probably will demand you throw down another cookie on the type that says, and, and I want to be called as an operator so that you can have underscore names that aren't triggering the operator syntax. So I'm probably thinking, well, I'm currently kind of mooshing around my head that leading underscore is your private field indicator. And if you don't have a leading underscore, you're a public field. And if you have a leading underscore, you're a private field. And if you want to declare yourself an operator, you're a function. There's a tag you put on the function that says I'm an operator. And as an operator, your underscore count and your name has to match your argument count. And that's where how that's how the operator parses. That's what I'm currently thinking. Not all of this is implemented. The operator syntax is implemented. The structural definitions for ints and floats are not implemented. But I'm probably going to do them because I want to be able to add a dot eq field and a dot hash field here so that you can have exactly, uh, you know, um, you can add the, the, the hashable behaviors. So here I have a dot eq, which takes a dot, which is going to be implicitly for the first argument. That's the shortcut name, the first argument. And it's just going to return it. The float has to do a, a float to raw bits thing. I don't have that. So it's going to be a math dot, you know, float to raw of a single argument, something like that. I don't have a primitive there, but that that's the goal is that, you know, EQ is a function that takes a this, which is an int thing and returns me an, an a box stamp returns me an integer, which can be done for a hash. Uh, I'm sorry, I said EQ. I'm going to say hash here. Freaking hell. And then there, there's probably going to be an EQ, which is going to have a dot and an X, which is typed to be the, an int value, which does exactly what you think it does. And so on and so forth, so that I can have ints and floats be keys and hash tables sort of directly. And then I'll, I'll, I'll promise you that ints and floats that don't do dynamic dispatch on EQ don't get boxed. Um, but then all your operators are defined. Right now, I am defining the operators this way, except not buried inside the struct there. Uh, I, I have a prims.aa file I'm parsing when I start the set system up or whatever the compiler up he, he he adds all the primitives just up front so all the the initial state of aa parsing is i have a, a, a an initial primitive mode scope opened up i open a file scope open a primitive scope i load the primitives i then finish parsing your your regular file because i've opened a primitive scope i have all these primitives in scope they're all immediately exported to the next layer out they all say things like plus, you know, underscore plus underscore. And, and you know, like minus has a underscore minus for a leading unary or trailing underscore for a leading unary. And the bang operator has a trailing whatever and so on and so forth. So there's a, there's a bunch of them. Not claiming I have them all sorted out uh, yet. But that, that's the sort of concept I'm heading for. So you can tell what to do with the operators, but separately the actual dispatch rule is you're obvious in scope and there was no dispatch or you had a struct involved and I did the field out of the struct and that's your dispatch. And that can be optimized to include basically become a V table. Um, so even though that int object I showed you right there in the code looks like a struct with a bunch of fields, though all those fields move into the V table and the int object has no content except the integer value itself. So then I can get rid of the pointer to it and not be boxed in many contexts. And then there's a whole auto boxing thing. So I have to sort on that one yet.
And now I'm going to look at Haskell links here because, oh, type classes. Okay, fine. And that's exactly a V table. Okay, fine. That makes sense. All right, I think I've seen this before too. Where did my people doc go? There it went. So I'd answer the question. Was there a question? All right. So I else, think that answered my question. Yeah, somebody else caused trouble because of my usual trouble causes aren't here. Or I'll go further down AA typing, which maybe it doesn't help people. I don't know. Maybe it does. What, what do you think of um, some of the recent work on like uh, reference counting compared to like garbage collection? Like people are doing like reuse right. analysis and they're getting like, you know, they, they, they make claims like they can, they can, you know, match the performance. Yeah. Right. So, so the, the, there's a bunch of competing things going on here. And, and so I think that under some conditions, things that look are being called reference counting would make sense. So the general problem with garbage collection is it doesn't recycle memory fast enough. And the next time you use that memory space was after the last GC cycle. So every time you do a new, that memory is fresh from the CPU's point of view. It's a no 100% guaranteed to be 100% cash miss since the last GC cycle. So a new allocation is a one clock test pointer bump in almost all cases, plus also a 100% cash miss, which is a thousand clock cycles and totally dominates the cost. It's completely nonsensical, right? It's, it's out of control. And x86 prefetches and does all the right things that you'd like it to do, except it can't just make a cache line appear in an L1 cache that's not first loaded from main memory. That was one of the fun things that Azul Hardware did. We did a, an allocation, did not actually go to memory. It just wiped a line clean in your cache forced everyone else to evict, but everyone else had evicted almost always because they hadn't seen that cash line since the last GC cycle for them either. Fine. So here, here and there, uh, GC has serious costs associated with high use, high volume turnover GC. You GC some objects, they have a long lifetime, that cost goes away, you don't care. Um, you do high volume allocation because you're streaming through a large data set and you're allocating for everything you stream through, then you're death by streaming allocation. And that's where all your time goes. And those numbers are like 5x easily. Like, like you can get integer factor speedups in single threaded code by not doing GC. Okay, so reference counting burns CPU cycles as naively done to an extent that it loses out the GC because it just burns GC cycles insanely. The optimizations people do can mostly defeat the reference countings by a fair amount. And in particular, you have to do something for cross-thread optimization so you don't have to reference count with an atomic operation. That'll be death too. Um, if you look at Rust, Rust does a proof that the reference count goes to zero. That's not what it does, but that's equivalent. It proof, proves that as well as something stronger. Um, and that recycles the memory much more rapidly, which could turn you into a much higher performance system because you're recycling memory faster. So to the extent that the reference counting can recycle memory faster and remove the overhead of doing the rough counts, I think they're ahead. Um, to the extent that they have to like keep piling on ref counts compared to like a Zool background collector, the Zool background collector is fucking efficient and will happily clean up behind your back at, a, at an incredible volume rate without any trouble at all. So, so it's sort of a high bar to meet getting a versus a good GC, but there are cases specifically where you're going to recycle the memory in a hot loop very rapidly, as opposed to like when I do these things myself, I hand manage the memory. I do a fucking malloc free in Java where I, I, I allocate with a new, but then I track lifetime and I do a free at the end if I need to do it that way. And that's a pain in the butt. I only do it in hot loops and I get this giant speed ups. So fine, that that's a thing that can be done and it's painful. The goal of the reference counting, in my opinion, the goal of reference counting every sheet, in this hot piece of code, I can reference count for you. They don't have to think about it. I can just say, make me a new string object, parse my you know network byte buffer into the string, do my math, and then carry on and not, not worry about it. And then the reference counting says, yes. And the string goes dead at the end of the loop. And I'll just reallocate the string at the start of the next loop. And I won't keep reallocating strings and you know life got better. Um, maybe. Yeah, maybe, maybe there's something there.
So this is something, uh, somebody put this down here in the, we would just, uh, I just had a, you know, five minute diatribe on reference counting costs, ref count versus GC. I think it has a place. I think there's still a pretty high bar to meet a good GC. There are some bad GCs out there for which maybe it does better up all the time. There yeah, are also, I do keep going back and forth on whether the borrow checker pays for itself. <laughs> there's a lot of overhead. It seems to be very it, valuable, but also very expensive. So it, 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 it's, it's expensive mentally, right? In the time it takes to write the code. Yeah. yeah yes. Engineering costs of the borrow checker are high. Yeah. I'm wondering if I can't do a borrow checker in AA with a whole lot less thinking about it. I don't know yet. I haven't, I haven't started on that path. Right. I have right. A, That's what I'm interested in. Fairly aggressive typing system. I might be able to do something there. I'm hoping I can do something there. Yeah. I was just interested in like the people who are using reference counting as like a way to like almost lift the functional computations into uh, like mutable ones. Right, right. It's just, yeah, so that's the main. So I, I guess yeah. I guess what you're saying is you can do that in a garbage collection system. There's nothing like unique about like you have to implement a, a ownership system anyway. So, right. Right. Yeah. And when when I say I do this manually, I do something really stupid and easy, but it only works over small pieces of code. Right. I, I, I pre-allocate the object and I know its lifetime ends, presumably at the end of the loop. So the, the canonical example is I'm parsing through terabytes of log file. And I have to extract certain fields out and do things with them that are best done as string-like things. I want to look at my hash tables. I want to do integer math. So I, or, you know, I turn them into ints or floats and I do some math on them. And then at the end, I'm done with a line of text and I throw it away and I go get the next line. So in that case, I pre-allocate the strings, but I don't, you can't change a string. So I pre-allocate a string-like thing. It has a string-like API, but it's backed by the underlying network byte buffer. So it, it just behaves like a string, except I have to know that when I flip that network byte buffer page, that string got zonked, right? Got wiped. And then I know at the end of the, each loop iteration, I'm not using that string anymore. And it's okay to see is the next line in the current byte buffer or not. And if I zonk, I don't care if the string got wet, whacked, but it's going to get whacked and start looping. Anyhow, it's all fine. And then occasionally I discover a string that I need to keep. And at that point, I stop and I allocate an actual thing a string-like thing that I'm going to copy from one to the other and say, okay, you're the keeper. And I throw you in the hash table as the key usually. And then I can go find them again in the hash table later. So I and don't allocate once per line. I allocate once per new thing in the log file. I find a thousand new things in the log file scattered throughout. I get a thousand allocations instead of a trillion allocations. And that's the speed up. But I had to know things about the lifetime. So there's no ref counting, there's no linear logic, there's no borrow checking per se. I don't bother outside the hot loop doing this game. Um, so as long as the scope is small and the lifetime sort of conceptually manageable, it's easy enough to do. And then the other trick, of course, is that the set of places where you get allocations in Java is much more, it happens a lot more often than you think. It happens in places that you don't expect. And that's where all your time goes. So you have to track down all those little hidden allocations in the hot loop and get rid of them all. And then, then the big speed up's gone. So that's yeah, fine. Ah, uh, there's a really bad sound there, Jim. Try again. Yeah, okay. Try now. Okay. So I was watching this thing about. Okay, wait. You're, you're extremely soft now. You went from. Try, to try again, but you're very soft right now. Talking into the mic here. Um, let me come back to this. Darn it. Okay, fine. Um, you can also type short questions. I'm okay with that. If you're sound called Jim, Jim's like far removed somewhere. He's in some funny part of the world, gets sound issues half the time. It just happens. Uh, let's do, you know, bandwidth. So, so the issue that I was just talking about by is bandwidth. Where high volume allocation just runs you out of bandwidth. So we were talking about bandwidth, but we were also talking about programmer overhead. That's one yeah. of the things I, when I'm thinking about languages, never quite know how to consider is computers have gotten really cheap. Developers have gotten really expensive. What are the places where I'm willing to say, this is going to be more expensive every time it runs for the entire life of the program because it's safe. You know, right. if I use a little bit more memory, but I save some developer time, it may be that that piece of code has to run a trillion times before it was the wrong choice. Right. So, so 
what I what I have ended up in because I was in the big data space for a while was that the question was, do I fit on a node or not? As soon as I go distributed, my problem got a lot harder. So if I can squeeze you onto one node, then you're a hell of a lot simpler to deploy, to debug, to develop, to do everything. But if you're big and slow on one node, but fast scaling by node count, then I have a choice of, I get this answer tomorrow or I get this answer today by going distributed. And, but the distributed brought a whole lot more developer and deployment overheads in play. So I always made the decision of if I can do a little bit more engineering effort here and then it fits on one node, that was worth it. So yeah, if, if I didn't care that it took an hour versus a second, I wouldn't bother. Um, usually I have this case of, it, it's, it, it is this giant speed up and it matters. Like when, when you're doing exploratory work, things that come back to you in 10 seconds or less, things that come back to you in a minute, 10 seconds and one second, a 10th second, all have qualitative, discrete human behaviors that matter. If it's more than a minute, you went and got coffee and you lost your state and it's hard to get it back. And, and it, it slows way down your rate of doing interesting exploration. If it comes back in a, in a second or in 10 seconds, you kind of look around and you kind of put your brain on hold and you, you don't lose it too much. If it comes back in a second, you, you just put your brain on hold for a second. It's a flash, it's back. And now you have your answer. You go to the next step immediately and you keep your focus. If it comes faster than a tenth of a second, you can't see it, you can't tell it, and it didn't help you. So, so those are sort of the breakpoints for human awareness. So if you have a problem that you can uh, uh, defeat, bring down from a minute to 10 seconds, it makes a true qualitative difference in how fast a data scientist can do exploration on a data set because of that 10x speed up. Now, if it drops it from an hour to a minute, it helps, but not shockingly as much as you'd like to believe because you keep losing your focus. The jump from you know a minute to 10 seconds is pretty big. The jump from 10 seconds to one is also fairly big. So, so dropping those ranges of powers of 10 is interesting and I'm worth throwing engineering time in for the problem spaces I was in for quite a while. Um, somebody Which asking, feeds back into rebels and developer productivity. Yeah. If I yeah. have a language where I want to try a piece of code and I have to run a three second compile, even right. that can be a barrier. Right, right. You're going from a REPL. When I drop it down from a minute to 10 seconds, you kind of want it in a REPL. When it goes from 10 seconds to one, you definitely want it in a REPL because that's what you're doing with it. So you set up your environment where I can tweak a code and hit the button. I tweak a code and hit the button. Tweak a code and hit the button. I do it in Emacs, hit the button, but you do it in R Studio, you do it in Jupyter Networks, you do it in all these places. You change something, hit the button, get an answer. Ah, you're exploring. This is what it's about. So there's definitely a, a human scale reduction in time on exploration. So we put this into the chat for the, for the timestamps too. It's like a good thing. Um, so somebody, somebody, somebody has to use C and then mom picked out two somebodies. So I'll do it. Um, and then Jim's got a question I haven't stirred at yet. You might want to read that question to the room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Yes. Sir. Here's a, my second try. Uh, is my audio any better? Oh, yes. Much better. Vastly. Great. Okay. Um, so Connor brought up, uh, I think, recognizing um, immutability that can be scavenged as mutable uh, in the context of, presumably, he's talking about uh, immutable uh, systems like uh, functional. Um, so I, you know, I have curiosity if this ever occurs in the JVM. Um, where there's uh, an immutable uh, array of something and uh, 
it only appears once. It only has, you know, one reference in the system. Uh, and instead of a copy, that memory is just written over. Um, so written uh, over as you roll forward through a series of one-shot immutable arrays. Yeah. Um, so when you're doing uh, Haskell, then yep. you know you've got no mutability, but you can identify, uh, right. you know, reference equals one and uh, proceed. No. That's the answer. I mean, when I left, we all understood what that was about. That work was not in progress and there wasn't any infrastructure in place to support it. That situation may have changed. But as far as I know, all the cases where people recycle one shot memory sections like you're talking about where you reuse an immutable space are all handwritten. So I talked about doing it just a few minutes ago for parsing large data files, you know, terabyte log files. There are a number of other places where I know like the streaming guys, the streaming array optimizations, but these are all hand done. Some guy tracks the lifetime, says this array is immutable, used once, this particular operation will consume the array, it will be done when it's done, it produces a new array, oh, those arrays are compatible, I'm gonna update in place. That is hand done. in the JVM as of my knowledge to date. And, and actually, you know, there's some people show up on this talk that aren't here today. Arthur's a good one uh, who would know if it, there's something going on there more often. But you could imagine a case that was definitely worth special casing. Well, so if you're in a language like Clojure where most of your data structures are essentially persistent hash map. Yeah and you're doing a path thing. So you've got a object with a million things in it and each layer is 32. So you've got four layers and you essentially have to allocate four objects every time you change anything. Right. Because you got to get all the way back up to the roof. There, the You want that pool of like four or five objects to be reused every time you go through the loop because most of the intermediates are never escaping. Right. I claim that the JVM doesn't do that that the implementation of persistent data structures can. I personally use basically that approach of immutable persistent data structures in AA's internal structure. C2 does it internally as well and recycle that memory directly. So I do a hand rolled version of an object pool in, in AA because it's Java and I have to use object pools. C2 does a hand rolled version of an arena, which recycles the memory exactly in the case we're talking about. But these are all hand done. There's no compiler optimization doing it. What is that You're, pool um, hanging off of? Because the persistent data structure itself doesn't seem like it would want to keep those mutable caches around in it. Right. I throw the objects to who I lifetime I know is like done on a free list. Uh, in the AA, because it's Java, I threw them on a free list. In C2, I would keep them in a big arena and just reset the arena button in some cases. And in other cases, I threw them on a free link list and then I would pull things off the free link list. But that's hand rolling malloc and free layers, you know, layers over malloc and free because I know the lifetime. But if one of your, if your root ever escapes, you need to go back and make sure that all the objects under it get marked as immutable before you start the next loop. Right. Yeah, and, and that, that's what I'm saying is <laughs> I, I hand did this, and if I, if I knew from the nature of the computation that was the case, we're all good. If I'm freeing a set, of, if, I've, if I'm done with a thing, I have it as a, it's a local root, I know it's done, it will, never, it will never be used again. I throw it on a linked list, for instance. And then, right, but it feels like you're hand doing it at the site where you're interacting with this data structure. It's that's not correct. in the library that is the type. Yeah, that's there's correct. a lengthy video about this topic. Uh, um, totally a language like called it. Rock. Um, yeah, let me find it. It's a ways back. Um, it's an offshoot of Elm, and uh, oh, it yeah. is uh, expressly making this optimization. Yeah, um, Elm is a good candidate for this optimization. Well, there's there's a video on Rock. I put it in there. It's the outperforming imperative with functional languages. Yeah, because um, Elm, by the way, is slower than dog meat. So, so that, like, my impression is that Ms. Feldman gives like a talk every few months on rock and how it's going, and this oh, okay. is a, this is the latest one. So, okay, 
Cool. Yeah, it's a, I see it. They've got, got some video watching to do here in a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So does that answer your question, Aaron? Or are you looking for something like, how hard can this be? I'm, I'm, what are you asking here? More a where is the work to make sure that the persistent data structures are efficient. Because I've profiled closure code, and frankly, it can generate a lot of garbage when it's going through a loop, modifying one of these persistent data structures right. where, frankly, right. one root came in and one root left. Right. And the only things that actually need to be persisted yeah. are the original right. and the final. And there was just a lot of things that didn't escape but generated a lot of garbage in the middle. Right, right. So the thing that could happen here is to say, I have a loop. I have a small, finite piece of code. I have to inline it to fuck. So it's all done, and then I want to do escape analysis and the body of the loop. That sounds like the garbage collector's job, not the no, no, definition the of persistent hash maps job. No, no, there's a, there's a qualitative difference here. There's a big difference. The garbage collector stops your program at an arbitrary point and investigates everything, including all stacks, which is a magic trick that none of the language things can do. So he does a magic thing you can't do it's outside the language to look at your stacks. Plus, he looks all your heap. And then he bulk does the free thing. OK, and the, the incremental versions do that on the fly, but they're conceptually the same for this context. The garbage collector has no clue when and where he stops you or why. And to be efficient, he stops you rarely. Therefore, the memory he collects is large but rare. And therefore, it's outside of your cache because you ran out of space for all that memory. So you, it was in your cache. Whereas the loop version says, I stop you precisely at once per loop iteration at a point in the loop where I know that there's not a whole lot going on. You're carrying some value over from loop iteration to iteration, maybe a couple things, but most things are dead at the loop start or the loop end somewhere that you draw a line to the loop. Most things are dead, handful or not. So now you do the complete escape analysis and everything in there that got allocated, you can show either didn't escape or it wrapped. If it didn't escape, you reclaim it. Now, when you go again through the loop, you use that same memory. That same memory sits hot in your L1 cache and just gets filled up like that arena logic does for C2 and reset and filled up and reset and filled up and reset. And suddenly you go from infinite cache misses to infinite L1 cache hits. That's your 10x speed up. That's the giant win. And that's going to be identical whether I'm using loops or whether I'm using tail recursion to get my loops. Uh, it, it, you have to have it a loop. But the tail wage recursion turns into a loop. So you're in a loop. Yeah, you're in a loop. The, the theory on tail recursion is, is the same in theory. You know, you're just jumping from place to place to place. It doesn't necessarily look very loopish unless you unroll that, all those jumps and lay them out. Then you'd see that you effectively have a loop. What you want is you have a, want to have a modest amount of closed space that you can analyze deeply with escape analysis to determine the set of escapes. Right. So the usual story here is that you have a bunch of exception paths that are never taken, but if they yeah, take- Yeah, that makes sense. What I care escapes. about is essentially, did you escape the basic block? Largely irrelevant to whether that was a function call or a loop back or right. whatever. Did you escape something? Right. And if you have a bunch of basic blocks, it's not, you have, after you've unrolled and inlined, you have a single, a, a DAG, acyclic DAG, but has complications. It makes life hard. It has a bunch of escape points for which if you escape, Every fucking thing escapes, and you have no fucking clue what's going on, so it makes it hard again. You might have to manifest a bunch of things you didn't bother to allocate because you were going to keep it all in registers and accept that on an escape path, which you know could happen in theory. In practice, never happens. But if it did happen, you have to stop and rebuild everything. So it's, it's a hard problem. It's no question. And one way to make it easier is to say the scope is some hot loop. But I have to inline everything in the hot loop in order to do all the escape analysis properly. Another thing I did at Azul, which is totally related here, was to do escape detection, which I do not have to get perfect on, unlike escape analysis. Escape analysis has to be perfect. Escape detection, I can say, statistically speaking, this never escapes. So I'm going to keep a breadcrumb to rebuild it if it ever does. But in practice, it doesn't. So I just recycle the memory right away. Um, and I feel like you can use counters to decide at runtime which one you want, whether this is a good candidate for escape analysis or escape detection yeah, right. or just go right. ahead and allocate everything who cares so these are hard problems that are being worked on as as far as i know there's active implementation work for both escape analysis for escape analysis in both c2 and graal 
um, and, and I think I said, like I said, Arthur probably knows more because he's in the code right now. Um, and, and what that state is and how far they've gone. Oh, Arthur's done a bunch of work on escape analysis. On yeah, of but it LLB, sounds like this LLB work LLB. could make serious progress on the performance gap between the immutable persistent data structures and their mutable equivalents. Because uh, right now the immutable ones tend to be twice as much resource consumption. Right, yeah. No, I think, I think there's, as a general rule for closure in the large scale, I don't know what the right answer is. I suspect escape detection because that'll handle all things in all ways reasonably. But I think you'd want to do a robust escape analysis where you could make it work. That's, you know, ref counting to the nth degree. And ref counting, actually for closure, ref counting might also pay off well, or a ref counting like thing, which is escape analysis of another name. Yeah, even in just a short time, when I was getting the CS degree, we spent essentially no time on the persistent data structures. And it was you, like, here's this thing off in the corner. It's used yeah, in Git. You probably don't care. If you and now do, it feels you know, like this is going to be a key thing toward designing. Yeah. If, you're in the, if you're an undergraduate, there's so much you have to jam into your head that, that this kind of stuff falls by the wayside. I, I totally get it. Once you've been in industry for a couple of years, I'd say go back for a grad student thing and they should talk persistent data structures and memory bandwidth and actually implementing a compiler and what you can and can't do easily and things like escape analysis should be part and partial of the shit. And I don't know, I don't know, you good typing info and there's a thousand other things that should happen, but I'm not that academic here. I don't know. Yeah, but I do really love the programming model once you get it of just assume that nobody else is mutating anything. Like it makes life a lot easier. Yeah. I'm throwing down numbers here. No. The other programming question I wonder, a lot of the programmers I use like CP systems much better than the eventual consistent AP systems. Oh, because it's just much easier to reason about. Yes, that's the one. A stro, the key value store, exact consistency, same as the Java memory model, but and very fast, like as fast as the fastest key value store and Java memory model is, is consistency. Uh, totally easy to work with. That was that was the deal. And you felt that it's worth paying the overhead to get the consistency. I didn't have any overhead. That was what was the claim. My what understanding I gave up was that H2O was causal consistency. It you was, sort of read your own rights, but you have no guarantees that you're getting the up-to-date yeah. thing. Java memory model happens before relationship. So it, it, you would read your own rights if you did a virtual-like key update I'm sorry, a volatile like key update, you got volatile like ordering guarantees across nodes. Or and I imagine a significant there. slowdown for using yeah. volatile. Everyone else screws it up. I don't know what the hell their problem is. It's 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 cheap and easy. So so when I did H2O, I started with a hardware cache designer in my you know left hand seat who said, you know, you can do these cash currency protocols any way you like, you know, this way, you know, that way, da, da, da. people like this, people don't like that, whatever, you know, Itanium does something weirdly different than H x86, which is different from ARM, which fucked up the first go, it got the second go, and PowerPC is weird, blah, blah, blah. So we talked about what you could do in the range of, you know, consistency models on a cluster, which is very similar to having cash consistency across cores, except you have a network socket and throw UDB packets at each other instead of whatever, fine. So, um, you know, the, the, the rule I have ended up with is if I, um, if I write something that's uh, uh, not looked at by anyone else, I can sync those writes at local memory bandwidth speeds. So if you continuously update a counter and no one's looking, it, it's as fast as writes to local memory. Not quite, you had a hash table update. If you uh, read a value that somebody else wrote, you'll get the reads from the last ordering point consistent across the cluster. 
if you, but you're not looking at every, if you're looking at just one thing, I only have to send you the one thing. Plus if you read other people, I know I have to send them as well. And there was another set of things. I could sync writes at memory bandwidth speeds. I could sync reads at memory bandwidth speeds. You, you got slow if you were reading and writing and somebody else was also both reading and writing. If you only wrote and read yourself and other people only read you, they got your rights in order streaming through. If you only read and one other guy wrote, you got those updates at a consistent pace at whatever, he could do right. many writes and you would pick them up periodically. Because if you're only writing, you're basically casing and there's not gonna be any contention. If I'm only, it's, 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 yeah, yeah, it's cheaper than that. If I'm only writing, then I'm actually, I'm just updating the value and I had to do a CAS in there eventually, yeah. But a local CAS only and other people would, would come get it from me. If two guys are both reading and writing, then you slow down. Both reading and writing the same keys. If they're reading and writing unrelated keys, it didn't matter. If they asked for a volatile thing, then they stopped and gathered. But if they were doing non-volatile updates of the same keys, I'm sorry, if doing non-volatile updates of unrelated keys, no one cared, the ordering was free. If they did vol, if they did the same keys, then they fought back and forth and the, or the time was a hop between the two nodes in the network. If they, one guy was reading and one guy was writing, it was fast and either order, who, who, who didn't care. And if you asked for a volatile update, then you took a hit while you ordered with everyone else, but you typically didn't take a big hit because you only had to order on the things you're going to look at next. Like, you, Did you provide people with things like a striped counter so that they could try to yeah. not get hot on one key? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the hot counter was not a problem because a counter can sync counts at a ludicrous rate. So what I gave you was a transaction. You, you also had a one key transaction. So you would send a transaction off to the home node for that key who would do the transaction, which was an increment. And he would just, you know, atomically increment and be done. And if you didn't bother to wait for the count to be committed, you could fire off counts as fast as you like and do other things. If you wanted to wait for the count to be committed, you had to wait until the reply came back from the home node saying, I did your transaction. What were the promises on the transaction? The, if you have side effects, they may happen twice? Uh, the when I try to do a CAS and I read the data and I do something side effecty and I try to write it and it fails. So I read the data again and try to do something side effecty and write the data. Yeah, the CAS that the, will the, succeed, but I may yeah. see my side effects twice. The the uh, uh yes yes the answer was the the transaction repeated as it stood until it succeeded, um with an atomic update of the of the key that was being modified. So there's only CAS on one or a transaction on one key. All side effects got repeated. Um, so you typically didn't have any side effects other than updating the key. You read fresh, you did something, you updated the key to its new state, that failed, you just read fresh, computed and updated again. Yeah, you got it. no side effects is a pretty item potent side effect. That's a nice one. Well, I mean, it's not typically how you did it. While you're debugging, you threw print statements in. And so you had side effects of like multiple prints. Or I wonder how many times this transaction fails. So I had an increment counter that incremented every time. And then I compared it to how many times I you know, did the transaction and got my, oh, it fails this often or whatever. The usual rule on the transactional update was that it rarely failed. You'd had to have a typically a really hot counter to have enough high volume hits to come in that you got hit. And then we gave you striped versions of those things. Like the standard default programming model had all this stuff broken out, log tree rollups with reductions instead of everyone shared on a, on a happy counter. Yeah, that's been my experience is, you know, 10,000 out of 10,001 keys are perfectly reasonable. And then you get that one hot key that has a lot of contention and people are trying to read and write at the same time. And right. So if you have that's that, where all your you, bottlenecks yeah. come from. Right, then you're stuck on the one key. For, for what we did in H2O, the big data never fell into that camp. So this was always to do with people doing like updates to the GUI where they're probing the space, probing some data set to try and decide what the, what the tick bar, hey, we're ticking along the 90%, the 91%, 92% for doing your model computation. 
and there are five data scientists running five models and they're looking at each other's tick progress and you had a bunch of things going on there, you could get some kind of contended updates. So you tended to not have like a Justin Bieber effect where the vast majority of keys are small and then you've just got this one account that lots of people seem to want to interact with simultaneously. Well, not one key. Yeah, that didn't happen very often. So we were all about, you know, big data and performance. So if we wrote such a thing, we, we eventually figured it out and went and fixed it. If somebody else wrote such a thing, um, you know, we gave them the advice on how to deal with it, but that didn't happen all that often. The usual story was they they wrapped layers around how you called models and how you did hyperparameter search things, and they had layers on how you did data set updating and data set cleansing and doing kind of shit there. Um, none of those would ever hit a hotkey issue. So we totally did work to make sure hotkeys typically ran really well, um, but you could you could drive it into a corner and have some issues. But our clients didn't typically hit them. So this internal engineering would occasionally hit them. And then we got really good, you know, the, I think that the main thing is you had the Java memory model, which everyone understood for your programming model for key value updates. You say everyone understands the Java model, but when the Azul boxes came out, they found there were a lot of concurrency. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, 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 I, yeah. That's fair enough. Um, we hired systems engineers. So it's a big data machine learning platform, right? So you hire some systems engineers for the big data distributed computation. You hire data scientists and mathematicians for the algorithm work. Well, the data scientists and the mathematicians didn't really understand the Java memory model, but didn't have to deal with it. But the systems guys did. We hired, you know, reasonably senior systems guys or bright young kids that we could teach the damn model properly to. But once you understood the Java model in one node, you understood it on the cluster. That was the that was the key observation of how you could hire engineers that were reasonable. You could teach a reasonable engineer the Java memory model is okay. Well, once he got that, he got the cluster model too. Yeah, I certainly agree with that. It's very teachable in ways that some consistency systems seem less so. Right. Well, it certainly beat eventual consistency for people understanding what the rules were. So you're doing hyperparameter search and all these models are advancing different states and you're trying to decide or different paces with, with what to fire off, which parameter next in what order. So there's some global update everyone's piling in on saying, I've gotten this far here and this far there. And then you want to look and take heuristic, okay, the next step is to search down this parameter, go there and you fire off another model. And, and you know that kind of thing did have a bottleneck where a bunch of people pile in on one or a couple of keys. But as soon as you said Java memory model on it, they got it and it wasn't hard to deal. So fairly straightforward that pace. So somewhere down here, we're doing distributed key value stores. And we do have a lot of concurrent updates. There's a really nice uh, concurrent hash map implementation. I know, isn't that amazing? Holy fuck, that was done because I had a thousand cores in a shared memory machine and I had to do something. There you go. The actual h distributed key value store is more or less a distributed version of a non-blocking hash map. They're, they're extremely similar. You just sliced it a little differently. And I claim that the key value update situation store problem is actually, it's not a huge, it's not a huge amount of work. It's not a huge amount of code. And it gives you, like I said, it gives you this really nice property of Java memory model and actually really, really good performance. And it's in the H2O code and it's like two pages of code. It's stupidly small because all these things are stupidly small if they work at all. Like non-blocking hash map has miles and miles and miles of discussion in the video and the key updates one, one big page. It's not a lot of code. Okay, well, it's all very quiet today, missing all our troublemakers. Hey, Jim, you had another question you were asking about at some point. I wanna claim you were. You're talking about immutable and do things happen or not? Oh, that was it. 
that was it. Okay, you got okay, you got your question answered then. Do, do, do. I should throw out a link for H2O's key value store. I think that's I got, I got one of those floating around. Like I said, it's not a whole lot of code. Let's see if I can get. Um, here is an old well, somebody's link. Okay, let me see if this actually works for people. So I have it on my home machine. I don't have it handy here. Where am I going here? I am. Oh, that's why I can't find it. I'm here. All right. So. Okay. Yeah. See, see what that loads. Does here. That's a couple of year old talks. Not bad. Yeah. This is the actual key value store discussion where I get into the nitty gritty. This is <laughs> this is cash coherency protocols done in software. Um, there's not a whole lot of code to it, but there's a lot of subtlety to it. But but when you play the game, but boy, it, it, you know, it works really well. <clears throat> All right, what else? Oh, so um, I guess, I, I mean, it's a topic to discuss, um, but uh, so the, I posted this link, this guy wrote, um, what was it? It was a Fizzbuzz and it, it, it was number seven. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm and so, it now. So, I mean, it's faster. Than, so the, the thing that interested me is that he wrote it in assembly yeah <laughs> because I, I i guess the question to i have is you know is it is the c and c plus plus support for avx2 really that bad is this like an opportunity for a new language that well you know, it's not it almost surely if it's using custom we, the weird intel instructions this is not a new compiler time this is somebody's existing compiler has to be brought up to speed. And usually the story is Intel's first on the job there. They'll give you easy hooks to it, uh, to the instructions, and then they'll give you some amount of reasonable loops that don't look too bizarre will, will use the instructions. The kind of tricks that you go through with FizzBuzz is usually you, you know something strong about the mathematics that the compiler won't know in general. Right. The, the, the problem here is that the compiler in general is not like doesn't bother knowing every possible reduction for finite forms like, like Fibonacci has some weird exact answer involving square root of five, adding and multiplying and screwing around and using square root of five. OK, I can derive that with discrete mathematics with some amount of effort. I'm not going to make a compiler derive the general case. So the compiler in general won't take FizzBuzz and derive the discrete mathematical direct answer, which means it has to do the loop as written, which means it's typically not very applicable to like funny instructions like what you get out of AVX. Okay, <clears throat> as soon as you do the hand transformation to a funny other version, maybe a AVX becomes possible. And also the compiler might be able to pick it up now, but you gotta start from a version that's gonna pick up that it thinks AVX is like in the sweet spot of what you normally would do. And then, and then you can get, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, well, my question is whether there's room for like a language that's specifically designed to take advantage of ADX, because the C stuff isn't cutting. I don't it. claim it's the C stuff is the issue. I claim it's not the language is the issue. I claim the algorithm has to be refactored in a version that looks more like what your algorithms that can tackle these instructions look like. Hmm. Um, and then that would be perfectly fine for both C and Java and anyone else. Like I know I did a bunch of work for SSE you know, prior two generations or whatever ago in C2 and that work carried on after I left and it was reasonably in place. So some amount of auto short form vectorization is going on in C2 right now. <clears throat> Okay, so what you're saying though is, is is you can go through this assembly program and you can rewrite it and see, and it should perform the same. 
it, and, and you have to use a compiler, which is going to use AVX if it is ever going to use AVX, which I claim Intel's usually pretty good about that. Okay. So you have to use the Intel compiler. Yeah, right. And whether or not Hotspot follows on and picks up AVX support, an LLVM for Arthur and his, you know, Falcon thing. Yeah, LLVM is usually not too far behind these funny instructions because, you know, Intel funds LLVM. So there's a reasonable chance that you could rewrite that in C code and get it off of either Intel. Like the first thing you should be able to do is write it in C code, except call out to Intel machine instructions directly. So it's an Intel only, and that's basically you wrote it in assembly, except you use C syntax, right? So if you can get it that far, then you can start to say, okay, I'm gonna hand the compiler this carefully crafted code that just begs to be called out for an AVX, but I won't call out to the magic instruction that says, and now use an AVX instruction and see if Intel picks it up, right? Yeah. And then if he does, you can loosen your rules a little bit and get a little more, you know, more C-like, more polite, see if Intel keeps picking them up and says, yes, AVX, great. I know they try hard to do like certain codecs and the like, they get video codecs and whatever to pick up their correct instructions. You have to write them in the right kind of way for the compiler, for the compiler to know that it's okay to use the funny instruction. Um, I'm just wondering, is there like, is there room for a high performance language where someone yeah. said, you know, I know you want to make crazy things like this 55 gigabyte per second, right. you know, right. assembly code. So, right. but, you know, but I realize, but then, yeah. you know, coding so Fortran is painful. Right. So. It's Fortran <laughs> followed by, followed by like maybe Futar, which is, you know, I don't know. Tomius is not here, but that's a language which does things with arrays that has a lot more strong notions of what it means to do something with an array. Yeah, but it, well, that's mostly for the GPU, I think, for graphics card programming. Um, well, those are often very similar because you have to you have to know you have an array that has no aliasing, has carefully well structured properties about how you visit and view it and look at it. And then you can jam it on a GPU or the same things you can do, a compiler can pull up AVX and do SSE things and all that kind of crap once you get sort of the, the obvious things going on. Yeah, I'm looking to see if there's an obvious FizzBuzz algorithm. There's a lot of people with implementations of FizzBuzz that got special in their particular language. Um, yeah, I claim you do an algorithm shift and then you could hand it off to somebody who would do AVX. I don't think this is a language issue. The, the usual story for AVX is that, or things like SSC and AVX is there's a large audience that wants to pay. Now they don't, no one wants FizzBuzz, no one's paying for FizzBuzz. So what are they paying for? Okay, I got GPUs. Why the hell am I paying for AVX instructions? What are they doing over SSC or, or whatever, right? Why am I not just using GPUs? Well, so Intel wants you to use AVX because, you know, NVIDIA has got the GPU market sewn up. So they're, they're like sucking compared to that. So they're trying hard to compete with GPUs by doing things that are difficult to do on a GPU, but could use some hardware acceleration. And as soon as you have some hardware acceleration, you have to shrink the complexity of the problem. You have to line things up for the hardware to recognize it, but then the hardware takes off and does something you know much, much faster. Okay, fine. So the, the effort to shrink things down to a GPU is enough that you typically only do it for certain kinds of things. And the effort to shrink things down to a single instruction, like an AVX thing is typically less. It doesn't require so much scope. So you don't have to rewrite your entire program. You have to rewrite some little codec. So you want this to do what people would wanna do. So this is like codec games, this is like uh, Blas libraries. This is like people doing finite element analysis and big array math over small data structure kind of or over Big array math over small code structures. All right. And then languages that, that excel at that looks like Fortran, look like C done carefully, stylistically, look like, I don't know, there, there are a bunch of languages that play APL, but APL does it with uh, primitives. The main specific languages which are interesting for that. So Helite, for example, for fast image processing, I would say this is a typical Cindy friendly language for CPUs as well as GPUs. What's the language? I didn't hear. Helite. I pasted this on the Google Docs. Ah. Helite lang, then Graphite lang for fast graph processing. 
It also is pretty good for vectorizing oh, graph operation. Look. And definitely Taichi, I would look into that because it has very interesting matrix operations, including sparse matrices often used in graphics, also allowing for vectorization. It's fairly new, but the paper for this language also cites all of the other papers. So it's kind of good as an overview. Right, so, okay. So I think that's your answer. It's not really a language thing. There's a, like a library thing, and then there's languages that are very specific for it. Right, domain specific. Ones. Very domain specific, yeah. Let me hmm. let me go get Halide up here. Yeah, let's see. I mean, this says Halide is embedded in C plus so. plus. Right. Yeah. Right. So it's C plus plus, where I'm sure the hot inner loops are either assembly or carefully aligned so that all the funny instructions, auto vectorizing instructions, can take place. What those languages do, this is true for both Helite, Taichi, as well as Graphite, is that they separate the algorithm from the blocking optimizations. They call those, you think of like cache blocking, tiling, yeah. they call them schedule, but this is not scheduling as you would do in a compiler, but it is really the different order in the blocking of the operations for the purposes of CPU vectorization. And that separation, I think it's very interesting. Because oftentimes the computation that you would like to express may be a very simple stencil computation. Say A of I is equal to two times A of I minus one plus A of uh, I plus one, for example. This is simple, right? But if you would like to visit over an entire image, maybe for some applications, it makes sense to make this in blocks of five pixels. For some application, it makes sense to make it in blocks of 20 by 30 pixels. And you don't want to intertwine this with your for loop that expresses the computation and have this for loop express your blocking strategy at the same time. So I think the separation of the computation in terms of the algorithm and the data layout in terms of blocking, that's a very interesting direction. Yeah, did, a, did a very similar conceptual thing. Like the, the what, what you're calling blocking, I would call auto parallelization and distribution around a cluster. And then there's an algorithm. And I wanted very carefully to have you not have to screw around with distribution and parallelism while you're writing the algorithm. So there was a clear break between algo level and what the, you know, the cluster auto automatically did for you. So your, your algorithms for H2O looked at some high level step of a series of blocking things to do with bulk arrays and then uh, map reduce which was could be modest to bazillion lines, but the map reduce would be, you know, what walked over some amount of your code and was dictating the size of the chunks that you worked on at a time and the amount of reductions versus whatever. So you, you kind of had a two tiered writing. Here's a high level algorithm. Here's each of the inner loops as simply as small as I can get it. And then in between those two pieces was the auto distribution, auto parallelization. I'm just looking at these languages and I don't know. They don't seem like they're general purpose though. They seem like they're they're just kind of yeah. you know, these random things they threw together for like right. doing graphics or well, that's that's the whole point or, of domain specific language. You know, uh, the right graphics cards came around because you could do graphics. That was games. Oh, there's a there's a highly specific use case. You could do 3D viewing of complicated spaces at 60 frames a second under high motion, right? That's a very domain specific problem. Whereas, well, I mean, the thing about assembly is it's general purpose. Like you can do anything you want in assembly so long as you're willing to waste enough time on it. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. Well, you could hmm. do fizz buzz in, in any language. The, the other thing you're getting- Well, no, that's language. the thing is I'll bet you can't do fizz buzz in these languages, be, be like graph it and so on, because you don't have the IO routines available. Oh, no, how, how I just says I'm C++ with special graphics things. No, no, that's what I was looking at. It's a DSL. It, it's right. embedded in C++, but it's not actually C++. Right. Okay, they're calling out for for the for you know I/O from C++ is totally obvious, totally expected, no problem. Now that's not what I'm trying to say here. I'm saying don't you the assembly path is like 
you know, why, why the hell are you wasting your time unless you absolutely get some speed up that's worth it? Okay, fine. The guy doing the fizz buzz thing, she's like a fun toy. Hey, look at this cool thing I can do. Okay, fine. Am I going to write my next application assembly? Probably not. Did I write the matter is, if you're not careful, you're probably going to lose an assembly. Chances are that C2 is better at register allocation than you are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, when I do my assembly pieces, I do them very carefully these days. Yeah, this is very true. Yeah, so, so I mean, that's what I'm thinking of is like a simple language. It's basically assembly, but with a register allocator in front. Oh, so then, well, there, that's you know. okay. So in the land of hotspot, not C2, the, there was so much back and forth between assembly code because not for performance, but because you had to do outside language things. You had to do stack manipulations of your self stack while you're crawling it for GC, for deopt and reopt, for uh, uh, switching from interpreted to jitted code and back and forth. So much assembly going around that we had uh, uh, the macro assembler. And the macro assembler was a C program, C language with macros that made it look like assembly, like writing assembly, but you're writing C code. And the macro assembler gave you all the support. One of the supports was it did modest register allocation, not a lot of it, not a real register allocator. But we totally had argued back and forth what we wanted to have a real register allocator to go with the assembly code so we could just have it, you know, do the allocation for you behind your back, or at least tell you when some decent allocation wouldn't work. What we did get out of it was that you could hand allocate and it would tell you if you had conflicts in your allocation. So you could do, hey, I know I, this goes in this register and that and that, and it carries through and you got inlining and inlining and more and more macro expansions. And suddenly you had a conflict where you reuse registers, you ran out or whatever. Then it would pop up and say, um, you know, hand manage your registers better here, dude, you're, you're not gonna work. Right, and, and like, I mean, it also, like it would, the language would handle like calling convention stuff. Yeah. So yeah. like, if you wanted to call a C function, you right. know, it would, totally. it would say, okay, I know how this is laid out. I'm going right. to you know, move the register to this register and so on. The macro assembler did that and had to. That was a key thing because all call sites have all the special shit on them. They're all right. safe points, they're all garbage collection points, they're all de-optimization points. So you had a lot of metadata associated with every call site. So that was mm -hmm. one of its key things. I said, and here I am calling C code or C is calling me or I'm coming from C or I'm going to JIT or I'm going to foreign function, da, 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 all, all different variations. And he understood all those signatures, could swap registers, do the register shuffle for you, and collect all the metadata and put the metadata off the side so the garbage collector and the DOP could crawl your stack and do all the right things. So yeah, call site handling, totally done. That's C2, not C2, sorry, hotspot. Macro similar hotspot. Uglier than hell to look at if you look at it. Pretty reasonable to use once you understood how to use it. So... Yeah. Because the thing that really annoys me about LLVM is that LLVM is not like a superset of assembly. It's like a subset. Yeah. You, you yeah. can't use jump instructions. You can't use uh, yeah. interrupts. There, there, there are all these instructions yeah. that you can't generate with LLVM. They're yeah, there's, a dip, there's a difference there. LLVM is trying to do a compiler where he understands the semantics. So it can do semantic changing, semantic preserving structure changing optimizations. Whereas the macro assembler was an assembler, the semantics were in your head only. It, it gave what you gave it directly. It would do minor things like short jump versus long jump offsets or different encodings that were more compact or less. Um, we had things where we couldn't patch instructions if they crossed the cache line. So he'd no op pad to force cache alignments correctly. But he didn't do program semantic preserving modifications other outside of this very narrow set of things. Whereas the compiler wants to understand what the hell this thing does. And so if he doesn't understand it, he can't make any changes. He can't make any changes around it because he typically understands the wholeness of the situation. And then he makes modifications all over the place for performance reasons where it don't work. Like if you say, and here I jumped. Okay, where the fuck do you jump to? You jump into the same code. I can't touch anywhere because I don't know how you're going to jump to. You jump out of the code. You ever jumping back in? Is it a return? Is it a call? Is it this that? You jump you... to a basic block. I mean, like you know, like like they should have just you, what they have in LLVM is they have basic blocks inside functions, and then they have functions on the outside, and they right. should have just not had any functions and made everything basic blocks. Okay. <laughs> like, you know, in the land of C two. 
that's kind of what it does, except it says there is a big wrapper, which is the compilation border, and I inline the fuck inside the compilation border to try to get rid of all those function boundaries. But there is a boundary layer, and I don't do anything across the boundary layer. And, right. I, and LLVM has the same problem. There has to be a limit. There's a boundary layer. I don't cross it. Within the boundary layer, I didn't care functions or not because they inlined it. And LLVM aggressively inlines too. C. No, no, but like the problem with LLVM is it assumes you're compiling C code. I know. Like yeah. That's what it's designed for. I know. It's I know. compiling C code. Yeah. And anything you do that's not C code, and it, it's like all this weird assembly stuff. How do I C++? Not, not allowed. Yeah, you have to get Arthur here. But I, I looked I looked at Julia using LLVM as a JIT. And the answer, of course, is LLVM doesn't understand there's the JITing going on per se. It's just, you called me again, I made some code. Doesn't understand the runtime. So all cross calls are done through like register and direct. Whereas in C2, cross calls are all done as an x86 static call instruction, which is you know half a clock cycle at best. Um, LLVM doesn't understand that. It's really runtime stuff. Normally it doesn't get profile data. One of Arthur's big hacks is he put a lot of profile data in LLVM. C2, of course, eats profile data from day one and does all kinds of magic tricks based on profile data. Then there's the things we call heroic authorizations in C2 because we know it can deopt. So we do these things which are incorrect if somebody does something later down the road. But so far, I've never ever seen you pass a null here. I've never ever seen a subclass here. I've never ever seen something else. So I put a little cookie down saying I've never seen it. And if it happens, I have to stop and deopt. Now assume this thing that's never happened will never happen and optimize that way. And that makes huge differences in the code quality. But you have to leave these breadcrumbs down in case it happens and rely on a runtime to unwind you and reset and go again. And LLVM doesn't have any of that infrastructure in place. So he can't do these things. That's part of the you know, performance delta between the two. He does some other things really well. So it's, it's a close tie. I talked to Arthur. He won't, he won't give me solid, easy numbers. I think it's because he's not actually beating C2 on a regular basis. Sometimes he wins. Sometimes he loses. It's not, you know, it's not clearly not a big win, not an obvious win. So if I wanted to use C2 as a compiler backend, like how much yeah. pain would I be in? Yeah, a lot of people talked about it. That's one of my goals for AA was to make us something reasonable as a compiler backend that got as good as C2 without having it be so tied in. The easy answer is you write JVM bytecodes. Okay. And a lot of folks do, you know, Clojure, you know, JRuby, Jython. Ruby on Rails, so, that, I named 27 languages that ended up on the JVM, not because of Java, but because the back end's pretty fucking good. The huh. JVM bytecodes are a stack machine. Yeah. The translation. I wonder, I wonder how much better or worse it would be as a target of compilers if it were, say, a register machine. Oh, uh, yeah. Like, does that actually matter? It, it has a tiny matter in the speed at which you get the first cut code out. So the, the, the step from interpreted to C1 is like a five to seven X speed up at the speed at which C1 can generate code, which is pretty fast. And then the C2 is another 30, 40% over that. So that first step is a big one. And a big part of the issue is it's a stack machine. It sucks. Were you to have a register machine there, you could generate assembly out of it basically at as fast as you can sync it from your decash to your iCache, like insanely fast. And it would be low quality bad code, but it would be super fast to generate and definitely faster than interpreting. So run once code, still always interpret. Run it 10 times, you'd rather do a stupid JIT where you generated naively from a register machine that was your core language instead of a stack machine. And, and then where we're at right now is C1 needs a thousand iterations and C2 needs 10,000. But there is a place you could be at like 10 iterations where it's time to switch if we had had instead of stack machine bytecodes, if we'd had uh, register allocated bytecodes. You know, that, that, that horse left that barn a long time ago, but that was kind of well known at the time. Well, that was sort of my question. When you build the runtime for AA, yeah. Oh, go, you're going to have to pick an intermediate register. language yeah, at some point, aren't There's you? There's a thing there. Um, let's just see. If part of your goal is that the AAVM is a good target for people to compile their languages down to, 
do you expect them to be emitting AA source or do you expect them to be emitting some kind of AA internal representation? Um, I, you know, I, I'm steering away from having them do internal IR, um, although I've had pushback from different people. So we might revisit. The problem with that is it locks your IR down, makes it very painful to go make future changes to IR. So the IR has to be well and stable before I lock it down and go to the extend only mode instead of, you know, lockdown. So my current theory is you'll write AA code, which of course has an even bigger overhead of switching from, uh, like it'd still be at C1 speeds. So AA partial is pretty fast. So it'll go from C1, it'll stay at C1 speeds to get to a reasonable IR and cheap ass code generation. To get to that really fast code generation, you want to pre-cook down to a pre-register allocated. Um, these days I go to 16 registers, 15 with a stack pointer, pre-allocated. And then if you're on a 32 register machine, you just double the numbers and have half the conflicts and get rid of a bunch of stack spills. But you could you know, basically have a generic machine that had 15 plus one registers and, and a risk-like architecture and one for one bytecode for bytecode transliterate to an x86 pre-register allocated. That can be done in clock cycles, all your time would be spinning, faulting it from the dcache to the iCache, which isn't that slow. And then you'd run it out of the iCache. So that time would be pretty freaking fast and that would give you a really good first run time. You would interpret up till you hit count of 10, then you'd flip and go to stage one and then you know, stage two can happen much later after you've profiled from stage one. Like as soon as you do stage one, you could throw profiles in. And it's so much faster to profile jitted code than it is to profile interpreted code because the, the interpreter has to collude too many things together and you get to unroll an inline and throw counters in the right place with the right offsets. And that, anyhow, counting is like 10 times faster in jitted code than in the interpreter. So yeah, there's a thing there you could get. Which begs the question of tier one jit. And say have yeah, no interpreter. You get a tier one JIT really cheaply, really fast. That would you give you get your first JIT fast enough. Maybe you don't need an interpreter. Um. Yeah. People go back and forth on this. I've I, you know I've gone back and forth. It it it, it maybe. Um, what about like a Chess scheme? I'm sorry. Yeah, people do. Yeah, Chess Chess scheme isn't it? Isn't it just a compiler? Like they don't they don't even. It's just a really fast compiler. I'd have to go look it up. I don't know, but I I totally know it's a it's a decent. Uh, uh, point it's a decent design point except that you you never are as fast as an interpreter for run once code <clears throat> and if you look at java startup there's a lot of run once code so you know do i do a no interpreter version if as soon as i say have a frame based pre-register allocated st stage one that you can interpret the cost of the interpreter isn't the interpreter. The cost of the interpreter is the difficult transition from a stack-based interpreter to a register-based calling convention in either C1 or C2. So, so you think a register IR and a register-based interpreter. You get a register-based interpreter. Might reduce some uh, of the pain of having to assembly implement and your the, language and the twice. Transition costs are low on the engineering side. The actual transition costs got boiled down to pretty cheap for everybody, but it required enormous engineering to drop those transition costs down. So here, the transition cost, the engineering cost for transition would be very cheap. You fucking make a stack that looked like a jitted stack, except it had just for the interpreter, uh, you know, just what the what the bytecode's called out, and then a hole which was variable size for what the jitted version knew is going to make more space on the stack or not or whatever. And then, you know, and that was your model. Then cross calling from interpreted frames to jitted frames would do almost nothing, leave everything alone and maybe bump a stack frame a little bit more. There's something you could do here super cheaply and super stupidly is the main thing. Yeah, fine. Whereas right now the transition from interpreted to jitted frames is a giant register shuffle, arg shuffle, and it's very delicately balanced at various points where you do and you don't. And if you have locking or you don't have locking and the locks have to be, no, 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 it's a mess. There's another question for you. Locking, if you throw an exception, I don't know why this counts. You lock, you throw an exception and you unwind a stack, you unlock as you go. What's the rules? What's the rule? There has to be something there. Sorry, I'm, I'm off on an utter unrelated topic because it occurred to me all the grief I go through for the setup for transitioning between jitted and 
interpreted code, a lot of it includes garbage collection, stack locking, um, DOP, and there's another big one that was a pain in the butt. I don't remember now. There's always a pain in the butt, by the way, for the return was pushed on the stack or not. Where is the return value? If you're a Spark chip or you're an ARM chip or you're an x86 or you're titanium this or, or whatever. I guess these days you're just x86 or ARM. If the return got pushed on the stack, of where? Stack of you. Sorry, go ahead. Is there any future where there is no presumed design differentiation between the interpreter and the C1 and the C2, where like LLVM, you have um, sort of every optimizer and filter available to you um, in your compiler yeah. pass. So, uh, but so, in the JIT, you would just have a, a stairway of these right. counters that apply to right. a thousand different um, analyzers and uh, optimizations. Right. Right, I hear you. Right. I hear so you. the main issue with LLVM is it doesn't have a runtime in mind. And I have a runtime in mind to go with my compiler. So it's not, it's no longer, the game is no longer a classic compiler game where you're handed some code and you're going to generate new code in a different language in x86 assembly instead of in AA or C. The new game is things are running. And in this game, things have performance counters that mutate over time. And you have events that are extremely rare to never over the lifetime of the run. And you'd like to optimize for them without having to deal with the backup case. And you want to generate code over time and not all but upfront. Um, and you want to generate it actually when you have performance counters in hand. And these are all things for which LLVM has no, as it's defined, has no chance at because it's not defined to be a runtime. It's defined to be a compiler. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm talking about using the profile of counters uh, as the guide for Pachinko um, in a much more variable gradient than C1 and C2. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, hard yeah. Well, but there's, there's, a, there's a, you know, a lot of well understood performance optimizations and, and the cost of sort of arbitrary picking passes over things far exceeds the value you get out of some small set of well defined passes. C2 incorporates like 90% of what LLVM does in one pass. And it does it much, much cheaper than any one pass of LLVM. So one pass of C2's core optimization beats 90% of LLVM's passes and all the performance gains. And it's faster than any one of those passes. So why wouldn't you do the one C2 versus all of the LLVM ones? That, that's, the, that's the problem that Arthur's up against. LLVM, in some cases, the extra passes buy him a little extra time but he's 10 times, 100 times slower to get there. And I get the 90% case in like a tiny fraction of the time LLVM does. Okay, so makes more sense maybe to have optional extra passes like super duper escape analysis as an add-on to C2 and just cut way down the, the, the pile of passes in LLVM. But there's a, there's a theory of how LLVM is designed, how C2 is designed, but let's C2 get nearly all the way the LLVM gets to at hugely faster. And then performance counts give me all the rest of the way where LLVM is at. And much of what Arthur has been doing is adding perf counts to LLVM. And now his other passes can make a difference. And you could go back and say, hey, we need a better escape analysis in C2. Well, we know that. We've known that since Grawl like, came around and said, hey, look, at we can do a Scala here. So yeah, you know, th there's a thing here. But I wouldn't start from the zone of, I'm going to have a, a giant buffet of compiler passes, I'm going to add them on one after another. That's a, that's a bad approach in all directions. You'll both be worse code and you'll be slower to get it. <laughs> um, that being so, said, I mean, the game is the, either one time and a compiler integrated. And that's what I want to do with AA eventually. So the recognition of the appropriate, um, you know, medium or light optimization is an overhead that would just kill the benefits. Uh, if you had uh, 10,000 optimizations triggering at yeah. different, yeah. you know, depths. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. The, the, the issue there is that, that most of your core optimizations eat all the heart out of most of the other optimizations. That's why they're called the core ones. 
And so there's nothing left for these other things to go do. They nibble around the edges and pick up little odds and ends that kind of got missed maybe a little bit. But the core C2 optimization eats up, like I said, 90% of what LLVM does and does it extremely quickly. And actually in a pretty easy to understand and uh, easy to extend way. Um, some of those nibble handful. around the edges can be quite significant. And you could Twitter you, made some changes to the VM to support Twitter's futures. Yeah, you could nibble around the edges effects. in C2 and, and keep adding performance incrementally to that core pass and have it all integrate perfectly finely and keep all your performance goodness and also start to pick up more and more and more of what, you know, what's going on. What? Oh, okay. Ah, okay, fine. Yeah, one of the guys that didn't make it today is we're, we're, we've agreed to go swap apple pie, apple butter, and apple cider. If you're in the Bay Area, you can join in the swap. Homebrew apple club? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I got two apple trees in my backyard. They produced good this year. I need to actually pick the remaining apples off and turn them into sauce and then probably butter. And I shipped off apple butter a couple of weeks ago to all my friends and relatives and they're all begging for more and it's the time. So I guess I should do it or they're going to rot on the tree. That's great. Yeah. And I'm, I'm drowning in apple pies. So <laughs> good thing to be drowning in. Yeah. Up to a point, like sitting on the <laughs> counter, I'm not, no one's eating it because we've all had three, <laughs> you know, I want to take a break or two for Thanksgiving where I'll make another apple pie. <laughs> Yeah, it's all good. Like I said, if you're in the Bay Area. Yeah, a couple months, I'll, I'll pick it up. <laughs> I'll come, come make an apple pie and have you pick it up. Yeah, I gave my daughter, she went to Berkeley to go to the PhD in the Berkeley, Davis. She going to the PhD in Davis. That's great. So oh, nice. I gave her as a, as a, you know, moving in gift, a, um, a, a pre-made, not pre-baked apple pie. She's got a sack of filling and a sack of crust, <laughs> a, a topping and a, and a crust. And you dump one in and smooth it and dump the topping on smooth it, throw it in the oven. One hour later, you got an apple pie. So we'll see how it works out here. Cliff's, you know, do it yourself, that's, apple pie. I'm guessing funny. her PhD is not compilers. No, anything but what dad does. <laughs> Four kids, all of them, anything but what dad does. <laughs> Sucks. No, she's gonna be uh biogenetics and and uh God, I can't ever get the other word. It's it's study of gene flows and disease and parasite flows through human populations. She was well into this before COVID hit. And then it was just like, ding, 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 you win the grand prize. <laughs> Your desired oh, yeah. degree of choice is desperately in need right here, right now. <laughs> People complain about x86 as a target, but man, look at DNA for a while. And you're like, oh, x86 is so nicely laid out. Yeah. Yeah, there's a difference there. Okay, fine. DNA is crazy. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was you know genetic algorithm over a billion years, right? <laughs> Doesn't look Have pretty. The class guy. Kind of amazing. Have you seen the class guy who like his his PhD was in like targeting like making like an artificial like like you know life forms to like you know and and he basically went crazy doing this because you know he um. He is targeting, you know, life sciences. Is, 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 that is his compiled target. So he like rewrote common list or made a, a common list implementation that targets LLVM. I watch his talk every time I feel bad about myself, like bad about my life. I'm like, okay, I have it pretty easy compared to this guy. Sorry, I was trying to I write. Common Lisp did its own code oh, yeah. generation. They have a bunch of implementations, but this guy. Um, he was binding to a bunch of C code, I suppose. That last really... last link from Connor, throw it into the into the, Oops. Into the oh, doc. Yeah. Or the link, not necessarily the YouTube one, but the I don't know what that one is, the GCC LLVM based JIT. Yeah. 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 So um, I'm going to circle back around on that one just to close up. I'm not there. I want to get there badly, though. Um, the goal is to have a runtime compiler integrated with the compiler. Probably at that point, I have to integrate a GC, um, but not have it be language specific like a JVM. So that's, that's my goal. Get it away from Oracle's ownership. Get it away from Java.
But nice. your plan for the end state is that AA will be written in Java and will emit the AA interpreter that's just a standalone binary. So the short version is AA is written in Java and emits, it doesn't emit anything right now. I don't know what my first target will be. And the next step would well, be Well, your AA first target's gonna be the REPL. I'm sorry? Your first target's essentially a REPL. Yeah, probably a REPL. Well, that means I have an interpreter. So the first target's probably a Java interpreter. So I do some sort of emission that I can run a REPL on and then maybe it's a graph-based thing and maybe I pre-register allocate it. Um, and then, uh, then I run it in a Java REPL fine and just play enough to know that it's going to work and it makes sense and it's coming together. And at some point I switch to be self-hosted. So that's my longer term plan. Somewhere in there, there's a typed assembly language as a, as a place to go to so I can implement the self-hosting. This typed assembly language is actually pretty easy. So I think that won't be a problem. Mostly I'm stuck on getting all kinds of type extensions. I, I bit off more than I should have, and now I've got too much and it's taken forever to get it to close, but it's closing. What do you mean by type extension? So I took Henley Milner as a base and I added records. It's kind of a well understood extension. I added nillable, which was a not well understood extension as opposed to options. So there's, there's a nillable notion, it's a true nil. Um, but it, Henley Milner understands it exactly. And I added an integration with forward flow constant propagation algorithm because C2, the observation was C2 mostly discovered all your types that you lost when you erased with generics. So can I do typing with C2? The answer came back, no, because I like polymorphic type variables. So I have an aggressive type analysis that looks pretty good, but it needs type variables. So I integrated global constant propagation and Henry Milner, that's a big step. That means shit like I can do flow sensitive analysis. I can do things like, in Henry Milner, I can do things like uh, constant propagation. So if statements have only one arm or the other known to be live or dead, they only Henry Milner unify on the, on the live arm, not on both. I have things like uh, dead code, um, can be have errors in it, and I don't care. And so Henley Milner declares you you have a, an error, a type error in this program. But the the precise typing I get on Henley Milner for errors lets me say, and it's now contained to be a single value that the Henley Milner would say you're limited to base ground types, you're limited to functions of of types to types, or structures with labels of types to types, and maybe one or two other things. Well, now I have an error thing which has some collection of things which don't unify properly. And if it's never used by anybody, then I don't care. And that's part of my typing. So I've done that as well. Um, I'm using Henley Milner types to lift uh, constant propagation types. Um, to make that all work, I broke Henley Milner up from a abstract tree walking algorithm to a, to a work list algorithm, which was unusual also. So a combination of fairly aggressive type changes um, all taken all at once, kind of backed into it. Looking backwards, going forwards, I coulda, woulda, shoulda, might have said, I'm going to not do some of these things. Um, like I would do a first round Henley Milner. If that failed, you're dead. You, you don't type. If that works, then I'd run global constant propagation because it gives me a much more precise typing, gives me a call graph, uh, gives me a bunch of other things. But I lose the ability. Oh, another Henley Milner extension base types, ground terms, or anything from the lattice. So three or the string ABC are perfectly fine ground terms for Henley Milner, which is also unusual as a non-normal extension. Um, yeah, so I've put off, bit off too many type extensions all at once. And like I said, it's mostly working. It's pretty close. Um, I'm rounding out the error situation now, and I probably need another go with where I lift types using Henley Milner at ambiguous call sites where flow propagation says, you're calling a common function with a lot of different arguments. They all merge together. So they all fall to the meat of all our argument types, which is some scalar value. It's like, I, I know nothing here. Uh, and then when you come back from the call, like a standard map call takes args from all places and functions from all places and the standard flow analysis says, and here you meet all the different functions with all the different argument types and I know nothing about nothing. 
Uh, but Henley Milner knows because he's got polymorphic type variables is exactly the poster child why I wanted Henley Milner. So he can tell the flow propagation, oh, past the map call. In fact, it was a function from A to B and a collection of A's. Well, now you got a collection of B's. And then flow propagation say, well, I know how to do a collection of B's and can go forward with a collection of B's and do more precise things. So the two analyses feed each other in the optimistic good way. So there's a set of programs I can type that no amount of Henry Milner plus flow propagation run independently back to back will ever be able to type. So I am strongly allowing you to type more programs. That sounds like fun. Is it a useful set of more programs? I don't know. So maybe a bit off more than was necessary and more than was useful. But it was I mean, a lot of those things fun. I think are highly likely to get you useful. The all constants or types seems like that's going to be really useful. The dead code doesn't get typed really seems like it will be useful. Yeah, that my theory on dead code one is I say if def Darwin, else if Linux, else if Windows. And in all the else ifs cases, you can have function calls that have the wrong argument count, turn the wrong types, take different arguments or extra arguments or whatever. And it'll all just type as a whole program on each different platform. And therefore you can write portable code. <clears throat> a lot more easily. Yeah, the theory. syscalls library. That's Syscall, yes. Huge. Yeah. The syscall implementation will say if def, but it won't say if def. It'll be if Darwin as a variable that's well defined, else if or an enum or something. It's probably an enum here. Um, and, uh, I started playing with growl um, for no good reason, but I noticed what? that the, the growl compiler. Yeah. Um, so I noticed that the compiler uh, features appear in Growl in your IntelliJ completion lists. Um, not that I'm sure that the entire Growl compiler is available at runtime, but if you had the choice between, yes, the compiler is in the runtime and you know optimizing itself, or no, it is you know completely pre-compiled and above the runtime. Uh, which side do you lean on? Well, as an implementer of this thing, I have to have it you know, open and exposed to me so I can hack on it. As a delivering of a product to a target audience who I expect to be more naive about compilers than I am, I would draw the line somewhere around there and say, you don't know what the compiler, how the compiler works, so don't try. You would shoot yourself in the foot a bunch. So here's another way to get what you want, which will probably be the valve. Um, which is what, you know, the JVM does, right? The JVM says you can write bytecodes, but you can't write machine code. But the yeah, compiler is pretty good about converting bytecodes of all comers into machine code. So you can write, you know, closure and, and JRuby JavaScript variants, you know, I don't know what, a thousand things on a JVM and have them work reasonably well. If you wanted to go beyond that and say, and, but I really know what the hell I'm doing with the compiler. There's no way to hook into the runtime and say, and here I want to tell the compiler something. And what I'll probably do with AA is have a well-defined line that says, you don't know what the compiler does and have a fuzzy line that says, I'm not Oracle, this is not a closed system, it's open source. You can cross that line, but you don't get support. So the two things that come to mind there, we talked briefly about snapshotting. Mm -hmm. If I have a way to say, hey, sys.eval equals nil, and mm -hmm. I have just removed eval from my system, mm -hmm. you could imagine after that that the JIT is going to remove most of the compiler because it knows it doesn't need the compiler and most of the compiler is not reachable anymore. And oh, you, you can't mean, load as, new code. As a, as a, uh, 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 and then I could snapshot it and deploy it to somewhere that needs a really small binary. Yeah, right. So I thought about that too. Like, what is the feature elimination set? I hadn't thought about the. Like if there's some call that's like compiler. delete eval and right. then minimize my right. Right. size in memory a, and then snapshot. That's a cute hack. No, I, I, I already thought through, hey, I want to have, I want to put out a device driver. Okay, I don't want a garbage collection. I don't want a JIT. I don't want this. I don't want that. I do want to pre-compile. Okay, somehow those options are possible. I don't know how yet, but there's some other possible. What you said is, and the general case is there's a JIT under the hood. And specifically, I can delete the JIT by saying eval equals zero. You no, know, it's done now. I can't get the JIT no more. But it has to be done at a top level for everybody. Like if you make a module that you're going to link with somebody else, somebody else gets the JIT and you're not small anymore. So I probably have a different operation there that says 
at some outside of the language level when you're combining parts from different places and running them together that you can ask for. Right, so no you're going to get different ways of linking with things. Yeah. Maybe I can link to another DLL and do a C style foreign function call. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. if I just deleted my eval, I can't yeah. call import anymore. Yeah. Like I'm now in closed world. No new code will arrive. I deleted eval. That's you can't say answer. I'm going to load a module that needs eval because you can't load a module because you can't do import because you deleted eval. Yeah, that's not a bad answer. I, I have to see if nothing else. Like I think very few users very will few have few use cases where they decide to delete the JIT. You have to, you have to, you have to be careful here because a JIT and eval are there's another piece. So eval parses from AA to some IR. Then there is a JIT which traits IR to machine code, which you might want to run in tiers. You might want to run after profiling. You might want to rerun if some profiling thing happened that had an event flip that says I need to reprofile and then re-jet. Re so jitting and the translation from AA syntax source code to some sort of IR are like should be separate steps. Like one says I type the proof view, you're correctly typed, but I didn't necessarily make machine code yet. And the other one says, I have this IR that's in the middle and I make machine code. Do I want to get rid of the guy that makes machine code or keep him around? Do I want to get rid of the guy that parses from AA to the middle state? And the one that makes machine code, you don't directly access from a valve. And you would, you would directly access it if you had a way to emit IR directly. So this is the distinction between a source to source compiler that needs to take the AA source codes and duplicate it and then you know change the grammar and to be able to recognize the runtime pieces and to intercept it and yeah. you know change the grammar You're um right. the, the, there is there is a in the land of java there's java c which goes from java source text to java bytecodes the jvm doesn't know shit about java it knows java bytecodes and it runs Java bytecodes and makes machine code on the fly and profiles and garbage collects and blah, 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 does a bunch of shit. Okay, fine. So, so expect something like that going on with AA as well, where there's a translation step from AA to some intermediate form, not Java bytecodes, some intermediate form. And then there's something that runs that intermediate form and generates machine code and GCs and hands over runtime with locking and race conditions and blah, 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 does a bunch of things. Now that runtime can be bigger or smaller. If I throw out the generate machine code, I can throw out the profiling data too, and it gets smaller. I can throw out garbage collection, it gets smaller yet. I can say closed world, can't add no more code, it gets smaller yet. Okay, there are places for that. People like that for certain things. Yeah, how to express that in the language that I'm trying to write a driver. And yeah, I hear you. It's time to boil everything away. Is and, and, and I don't have a good idea for that. No, no, but you, you've got it already. So you say sys dot eval is nil, get rid of the parser. Well, I can say sys dot generate IR or query the IR or do something with the IR, it goes to nil and it starts from sys dot. And again, okay, that's cut out. I can't do that no more. Now I still want to generate code up front. So there's something has to be done where I pre-cook the data, uh, pre-cook the code and generate machine code. But the semantics said, but I can't ever look at the IR or generate code ever again. So whatever came in the beginning is what I got and I'm done. And that has to be, you know, that's how I'm gonna execute. You know, I might execute as an interpreter only. I was no jitting at all. And, and that might be slow, but interpreters are really small and they don't have any code bloat. So, you know, you can make an even smaller guy that fit on a nano, you know. There's also security well. reasons where you wanna say, I would like to run this in an environment where I can never set the no execute. Or I can never set the execute bit. Yeah. Oh gosh, it's helpful for doing the OS. no JIT case. Right, right. Where I have to screw around to get JITed code. Yeah. I think V8, you can actually give it a flag and say interpret only. Don't generate. Yeah, when, when V8 code. generates code, how does it get re-injected on Apple OS? They, they have to come through and ask permission. Please, may I, may I execute this code? There's some path that is allowed for user mode operation, or is that special only for V8? I believe they get their binary signed by Apple as a okay. code generating thing. So you have to get yeah. a special sign from Apple. Okay, fine. Probably means. Or that. you can sign it yourself and add your own key to the key ring. Ah, right. 
Uh, okay. Okay. So, so if you're developing Google... a JIT, then you say, "Hey, I'm going to sign it myself." And by the way, I'm adding this to my rule, but it won't run on anybody else's Mac. Right. Right. Well, and I'm constantly generating a new binary because I'm debugging my own JIT, and it's full of shit and it crashes all the time. And in fact, it does horrible stack overwrites just because it made a mistake and not and it for an attack. And, <laughs> right. So I want to have some way that says. Make the binary, sign it for myself immediately for zero cost, and then run it because I'm in the debugger and I just edit a bit and I hit the go and I edit a bit and I hit the go and I edit. And I, don't, I, don't, I don't want that cycle to be slow because I have to sign, but fucking Apple will let me run my own code. And I don't know how they do that. I'm sure there's a way they do that. I just don't know what it is. Fine. But All they're right, really picky about signing hours. those things on iOS. Right, maybe maybe there's an answer that I have a I build an iOS in a particular format that says you're suicidal, but you can kill yourself any way you like. Fine. I mean, I don't even know of an example of a JVM for iOS. Maybe well, right. No, exist, Apple but... said no, no JVMs on iOS. It's just like, dude, what the hell? Fine. Well, they shot down, you know, they shot down Sun's attempt to take over the web, or part of that was shot down was can't have Java running for webs. But JavaScript came along and everyone loved it. And now suddenly I want to generate code for JavaScript for the web instead of Java. Okay, you got rid of Oracle's name on the thing, but we're still generating code. So there has to be a path. So they got that path, the path exists. It's not a security hole for them. <laughs> Are they gonna share? Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. All right, I'm gonna call quits here. At some point I'm gonna eat my lunch. Sounds um, good, thank you. Yeah, it's a good conversation. Kind of went a bunch of places, not that I expected. So it's all good. I'm going to spend some more time thinking about the how do you minimize your binary when you need the full power of the language to build the world in the first place. Throw throw your discoveries in a, a GitHub um, you know event or a GitHub whatever item. Just yeah. open an issue on uh, AA maybe? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have a bunch of things I plan on, want to do, thinking about that they probably should throw into issues just so they don't get lost. Yep. Okay. Cool. Thanks. That's All fun. right. Till we meet again. Bye bye.